series, which, which will feature Indigenous library colleagues and has been organized by Carl's Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. I'm Julie Moray, one of the program officers at Carl. Before we begin, please note that simultaneous translation in both French and English is available for this session and can be accessed using the interpretation icon in the bottom right corner of your Zoom window. Une traduction simultanée en français et en anglais est disponible pour cette session et est accessible via l'icône d'interprétation dans le coin inférieur droit de votre écran. We recognize that French and English are currently privileged over many other Indigenous dialects spoken across Canada and that capacity building is required to protect Indigenous language rights and promote more inclusive participation in the future. I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge that today's panelists and attendees are joining us from the unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples who have lived and worked on this land for millennia and continue to do so today. My home and the Carl office, located here in Ottawa, capital of the country we now know as Canada, are built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. We welcome you to add your own acknowledgements into the chat and to honor and recognize the ongoing contributions of the first peoples of these lands. I'd also like to take this opportunity to go over the logistics for the session. Participants have been muted upon entry. Following this introduction, the chat will be closed until the question and answer period at the end in order to allow our presenters to focus on the discussion. You are encouraged to type your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Links to the Carl Code of Conduct have been included at the beginning of the chat thread. The organizers of this webinar are committed to providing a welcoming, professionally engaging and safe experience. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact a member of the Code of Conduct Committee for this event, whose contact information has also been listed in the chat. Auto-generated captions have been enabled for this webinar, which is being recorded. Finally, more information on this series and other CARL EDI initiatives can be viewed at carl-abrc.ca slash EDI. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for the session. So Camille Collison brings expert knowledge and lived experience to our conversation about indigenous knowledges and relationship building in library, archival and cultural memory praxis. Uh, Camille is a Talton Nation member, the university librarian at the University of the Fraser Valley and a passionate cultural activist pursuing a PhD in anthropology at the University of Manitoba dedicated to critically examining the relationship between cultural memory institutions and the continued survival and activation of Indigenous knowledges, languages, and cultures. Welcome, Camille, and without further ado, I invite you to lead our discussion today. Well, thank you, Julie. I'd like to begin by thanking all, all of those who have um, joined us today, all the attendees on this third panel. Uh, featuring Indigenous library, library colleagues, and to thank our panelists for uh, leading us in this important discussion. Um, in addition to this, I'd like to remind participants that the panelists are speaking from their own unique perspectives and experiences, and that these viewpoints should not be generalized to represent all Indigenous librarians or all Indigenous people. So I think that that's really crucial today that we don't speak on behalf of our nations either. We're speaking from our personal perspectives. Um, uh, so with that, I'd like to be able to introduce some um, amazing uh, um, librarians that ha I greatly admire and respect. Uh, the first one is Sheila Rurock, and she is Métis from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Her Métis heritage comes from her father's side, and she grew up just outside of Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. After five and a half years, um, her journey took her to um, for her master's um, to Edmonton uh, from Toronto and uh, she came to, back to Saskatoon in March 2020 and now is working at the University of Saskatchewan as Indigenous Studies Librarian. Welcome Sheila. Our next panelist is uh, Michaela Redden, who is a Anishinaabe Cree, uh, born in Peterborough, uh, Ontario. Her grandmother is from Curve Lake, uh, First Nations and um, uh, she um, is both living and working in, um, at, in, in Toronto and the Information and Instruction Services Librarian at the University of Toronto. Uh, the next panelist that we are welcoming today is uh, Kiyulaha um, Moorwood, who is Inuit, and um, she is from Kujar, 
are a pick and I'm probably not saying that correctly. So I'll let her say it as well too. Um, and um, she grew up in Treaty 7 territory in Medicine Hat, Alberta um, and in BC as well. So after completing her master's at UBC, she's now the Indigenous Initiatives and Services Librarian at Okanagan College on the unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan peoples. Uh, and uh, the next panelist that we have today is Jesse Lawyer, uh, who is Cree, Métis, and a member of Michelle First Nations. She is a librarian uh, at Mount Royal University in Calgary and a guest on Blackfoot and Treaty 7 territory. Uh, her research um, looks at Indigenous perspectives on information literacy, supporting language re revitalization, and ongoing reciprocal research relationships. Um, using um, both Nihawa and Mischief Concepts of Kinship. Uh, so right now she's also, in addition to that, the Director of Prairie Indigenous Relationality Network. And I'm gonna let her uh, say the name of that, which brings together Prairie Scholars uh, working on relationality. So I would like to be able to um, uh, work on, um, ask each one of them to introduce themselves and to answer our first question, which is, um, how did you come to choose a career in libraries and um, uh, who helped you in this process, who lifted you up and, um, and uh, what was something that you both found surprising, good and bad in librarianship. So I'd like to be able to start off um, with you and then you can also introduce yourself. I also wanted to mention that I'm really honored today to be coming to you from, um, from Stolo Tomex and uh, which is sacred land of the Stolo peoples. And I am uh, honored to be able to be here from the University of uh, the Fraser Valley uh, where I'm their university librarian um, to a terrific staff who's been able to, um, and, and librarians and our students who've been able to keep our libraries open during the catastrophes that have happened this last week. So it's because of them that I'm able to still join you today. Uh, so that's a little bit about where I'm, I'm uh, re residing today. And um, I'm going to move this over to um, Jesse for the first, um, a person to ask, answer this question, just, just tell us a little bit about herself and how, how did she choose a career in libraries? Who lifted you up? And um, who helped you in this process? Or what is something that you found surprising, both good and bad? Right. So that's in it, the thick, just in it, I guess, and tell of good, I'm going to get not to screen. And don't get a mistake, I mean. So my name is Jesse Lawyer. I am from Michelle First Nation, Korean Metis. And I'm a librarian at Mount Royal University. Um, I grew up in Callahoo, but I live in Calgary now. And uh, yeah, I'm really, I was just like perusing the list of participants and I saw Deborah Lee's on there. And that's definitely someone who I, during my, during library school, I came across some of her writing and, you know, feverishly, probably about this time of the semester, you know, emailed her out of the blue and was like, I'm so glad that you exist. <laughs> Because it is, it can be a really uh, lonely place to be in, right? There's not that many Indigenous librarians. So I was really grateful to just even come across her work. And she was so gracious and she's a very good friend now. So it's so nice to have, uh, have that continuity, right? From when you're a student and starting out there. Um, I Truly, I could name a thousand people. There's so many people that sort of opened my eyes to it when I was a student at Mount, or when I was a student at, U, at UBC. Um, IFLA held a spring program that was on Indigenous knowledges. That was the first time I was in a room of Indigenous librarians from all over the world. Maori librarians, Sami librarians, Kanaka Maoli librarians from Hawaii. And it was such an exciting experience to be surrounded by these people who spoke the same kind of shared language of, of, of working for sovereignty, of thinking through the same baseline that I had and thinking about information is so much more than sort of what we were talking about in, in our classes. And so there's a ton of people that, that were at that that I think were, it was so exciting to be a part of. I wanted to become a librarian because um, I didn't, uh, I wanted 
to be able to be interested in lots of different things. Uh, I never loved the idea of going to grad school just to study one kind of passage in Shakespeare. I really thought that I wanted to be interested in lots of things. And I thought I would end up uh, working in a place that was, you know, like a community center slash archive slash museum. But I ended up in an academic library and um, I've been really supported at Mount Royal, um, which is a small undergraduate teaching institution and thinking through the kinds of things that I need to do this work, right? That, um, that autonomy and that flexibility that is pretty essential if you're trying to think about connections to community and doing work that doesn't necessarily always look like what we expect librarians to do. Uh, in terms of what surprised me, <laughs> I think back on this sometimes from an academic library perspective, I just shake my head. And I um, was going to interview for a job at a university in the prairies when I was still in, you know, still in library school. And I turned it down because I didn't have the money to fly to that place. And I didn't realize that a university would cover that, like that was part of their um, recruitment process. And so, so much of how academia works had, was new to me. Um, especially sort of the, the sort of academic librarian process or right? how that can look really different in different places and the expectations. So that was a, that was maybe a, a later on someone was like that they will reimburse you. That's not a problem. But that was one of the things that surprised me. And in terms of my, my work now, I think the thing that continues to surprise me is that um, students are so excited they're, they have so much passion for what they're doing and the role that we play in that is really essential, right? And, and not dampening that excitement, but get, giving them the tools, giving them the, the resources they need to actually follow that passion. I mean, I think when we, when we see Indigenous students who are new to the university too, I think about myself and um, we have such a huge role to play in that. And that really is a, is a fun surprise every semester. I'm reminded of that. But yeah, actually, I think that's, that's probably everything. Well, thank you so much, Madhu, um, Jesse, and I appreciate uh, you sharing with us and for all of those who are with us today. Um, I uh, wanted to ask uh, Michaela to go next and to answer the same questions. And I'll just remind them to introduce yourself and let us know who helped you in this process. How did you choose a career in libraries and who lifted you up and maybe something that you found surprising um, both good and bad. That'd be great. I'll just turn it over to you. Welcome. I'm Bojo. Um, I'm so excited and nervous. Um, Michaela read an addition class, uh, Curve Lake First Nation, Onjiba Nokomis, um, in Donjiba Peterborough, Martin Indo Dam. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to end with that and then jump into what I have to say. So I'm Michaela Redden. I'm, I live and work on Treaty 13, but I'm from Treaty 20 and still call that place home. Uh, so this is sort of an, a non-answer answer, but I didn't, I did not realize it, but I wasn't actually like out at my first job or really at, at grad school. Um, so I, so it, it didn't really occur to me that I had been seen as native my, my whole life. And so it didn't occur to me that, uh, that when I would, when I went to grad school, they, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't see me. They're like, oh, I thought you were Italian. Um, so this happened, but this happened later, like after grad school. So I co-opt though in grad school at Lakehead University and it did not occur to me whatsoever that I white passed in Thunder Bay, uh, but I but I did, and so um, I went up there. I was so excited to have a job at Lakehead, just to be in Thunder Bay, um, like just such a such a unique place compared to where I'm from in Southern Ontario, and I'd never really experienced white passing before, though. So it might kind it might sound kind of strange, but I don't know, it, it, it recognizably up there, like I'm Anishinaabe Kwe up there, recognizably people are like OG Cree. Um, and yeah, so I was white passing without knowing it. 
Um, and so I, but I, what I kind of did was I stuck myself to the librarian at, at Lakehead, who is responsible for the um, Northern collection. It's a, it's a special um, collection that they have. And she also had a relationship with the Native Access Program, which provided kind of the high school equivalency for Native folks who were from the North or from up there. And they, you know, they wanted to come to Lakehead and they wanted to start their undergraduate degree. So this whole time I'm, I'm involved with all of that, but I, but I was flying under the radar again, still without knowing it. It, like I was like leaving that position and they were like you're native yeah uh <laughs> so just but prior to that I hadn't really connected being that like being native and being a librarian or an aspiring librarian put me in any sort of unique position even um I just kind of was who I was I think that I I had always been I had always been someone who was in like interested in in academics I at one point I wanted to be a professor and then I thought no I don't I don't think I can do it all that marking and stuff I can't do it um and so I became a librarian I knew a few librarians completely non-indigenous folks and I thought what a cool job they love their jobs um so there I went um people not even realizing I was native and I don't know, but since making that connection, I met so many awesome folks, um, librarians, but also people in higher education in general. So Trudy Russo, if you're here from Lakehead, thank you for taking me under your wing. You're excellent. And I love the work that you do. Um, I then went out to Halifax um, to Mi'kmaq and Raymond Sewell, not a librarian excellent person. Thank you, Raymond Sewell. Joseph McQuabby has now passed away. The most, one of the most excellent people I've ever met in my life um, helped me get where I am today, helped me get my job at U of T and my absolute soul sister, a curriculum developer, um, indigenous baddie, Shannon Winterstein, also probably not here today. That's my credit. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, Madhu Miglitch, I appreciate you um, sharing with us today. I'm going to now turn over to, um, uh, to Sheila and ask her the same question to just introduce herself and uh, talk about who helped you in this process and, um, you know, how did you choose to be a librarian and who lifted you up and what about some surprising, both good and bad um, things in our profession? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so where I am from is where I live now. Uh, so I'm from Saskatoon and I'm that's where I'm here. Um, uh, hmm, how, how do I unpack where that is? Uh, so, OK, um, my uh, I'm in my home and like we say, like, uh, ob like obviously, uh, we say like Saskatoon, like Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis and uh, kind of a funny story. Like my partner um, is uh, Cree from Muscaday and like works um, for Cress Housing, like the housing initiative of like um, Saskatoon Tribal Council. And he did a webinar last week with like Jolyn Lafond, who is the executive director of White Buffalo Youth Lodge, like the Saskatoon Tribal Council stuff, and they didn't do a, a land acknowledgement. And I was like, you didn't start with an, a land acknowledgement. What is, whoa, what is this? And he was like, wow, I'm not going to do a land acknowledgement like in my own land. So he's like, we don't do that. So anyway, I'm not doing a land acknowledgement, but that's where I am. <laughs> so uh so yeah, I'm in Saskatoon again, and I'm, uh, yeah, again. How did I choose to be a librarian? Uh, I didn't really choose a lot of things that have happened to me. Um, I've been told that I was smart since like the age of like two. So like, okay, like no pressure, but like I grew up knowing I was smart. So I had to do something and like, 
uh, after a, like a series of spectacular fails in my uh, 20s, uh, anyway, like I ended up <laughs> at the University of Toronto in my master's degree. Uh, that's just like short answer for a long story. Um, so I didn't, I don't feel like I chose this, but I feel like uh, eventually it worked out and here I am. Um, yeah, so who who am I? Uh, or like, uh, who's helped me? Oh, like, like after a series of spectacular fails, um, there's like a community like that surrounds me, that's behind me, that like has lifted me up like time and time again. I'm like, I can't even begin to thank them enough. Um, uh, uh, anyway, I don't wear makeup often anymore, but when I do, like I wear expensive, so I'm not gonna ruin it and cry, but just say there's a lot of people on this call that have also helped me. Um, Deborah Lee, you're one of them. Uh, and still like so much to this day, like it's amazing. Uh, Jesse Lawyer, like, are you kidding me? Like, remember when we met? <laughs> like both on Twitter and on in real life. That was fun. Um, Jesse, I remember your first keynote at Willow in at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And like at the time, imagine it was like 2017. I'm unemployed. Like I'm in at home watching this keynote and like Jessie has like a slide up behind her of like all these other, like shout out to all these other indigenous like librarians. And like, my name was on the screen and I was like, what? <laughs> okay. So uh, I was like, well, I, after that amazing talk, I like logged off and I was like, well, I guess I should have finished up my application for that job that I saw at the University of Alberta. So <laughs> And like uh, trying to explain that to like my parents was like, my friend from Twitter did this and that. And they're like, okay, so did you finish it or what? <laughs> so anyway, um, also like Tanya Ball and Kayla Larson. Oh my God. Like, holy, uh, like, like just thank you so much. I like my friends um, forever. Like even when I was like, I took a, like my G my journey has had so many detours and the things and like when I left academia the f intentionally and they were still my friends and still and like supporting me and like trying um finding ways to like everyone support each other and it was just yeah I can't I'm not being very articulate but like because there's so much love there it, it's hard to articulate um yeah what surprised me uh <laughs> um so like I took four years off uh, to do some fails like between my undergrad and like coming to uh to my master's program oh cool a phone call right now no thanks it's a scam anyway um I took four years off and like I remember like meeting people like first kind of week um, like and like you don't know what to talk about so you talk about school and like other schooling that you've done and like a common question that I got was uh, well is this your first master's degree and like just being floored by that question I was like yes like I couldn't believe what I was being asked I'm like yes like one master's degree like what is enough like what are, you, what are you talking about like I couldn't really understand what was being asked of me and like I was like because like uh the every time that I've gone to university like the questions that I've got were like are you sure this is what you want to do like you don't have to go to university if you don't want to like mm, real like okay like you can go but like you can also do anything you want it's like well i know i can do anything i want but like this is what i want i think anyway um yeah so that's what surprised me uh was just like i didn't really realize like how much of like the world of academia was like not like 
where I had been and like what um, what I had been dealing with uh, in my world. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Sheila. I really appreciate you sharing and I'm so happy that you're here. Um, and I just wanted to um, now turn it over to Keila. And uh, we're so happy that you're able to join us. And I think you're our most recent grad. So um, really excited that you're here today. Um, and if you could just tell us uh, just a little bit about where you're from and um, um, how you got into librarianship, what surprised you, who helped you, and a little bit about your journey. Thank you. Tunga uh, Sugitsi, everybody, welcome. Um, so my birth mother is Inuit from Kujawarapik in Nunavik, and um, my adoptive parents are originally from Quebec City and Winnipeg, and they have British and Irish Icelandic backgrounds. Um, and I'm joining today from the unceded traditional territory of the Seals Okanagan people. Um, so I think there's a you know, just, just a few people to acknowledge um, as guides and supporters on my way to becoming a librarian, which has been, I think that's sort of a surprising thing is ending up as a librarian, um, totally unexpected for me. Um, my background is in fine arts and I worked at Emily Carr University for 25 years. Um, and I, you know, did courses in interior design and makeup artistry and, and, uh, carpentry and all these other things. So it's, uh, I hadn't really thought of a master's degree as sort of being on the, on the radar. Um, but I'd say when I worked at Emily Carr, um, I worked with Brenda Crabtree, who's the director of the Aboriginal Gathering Place. And she's also an amazing artist and educator. And she was the one who really encouraged me to connect to Inuit culture. And she welcomed me into the Indigenous community of, um, at Emily Carr, which, um, you know, previous to that, I hadn't really had those connections growing up in a settler family. Um, so, uh, I have a, a real place in my heart for her. And um, she really believes in that power of education. And she's talked about indigenous people living in this space, uh, sort of between worlds of traditional knowledge and contemporary knowledge. And she provided me so many opportunities uh, to learn. And it was through that mentorship that I thought, well, you know, what I would like to do is to work in a way that supports indigenous students um, or communities. Um, and then I also have to do a like shout out to my one of my best friends, Trish Mao, who is a librarian at Burnaby Public Library, because she's talked to me for years about she's like, you got to go to library school. When are you going to library school? Are you going to library school yet? Um, and so I looked into the First Nations curriculum concentration offered at the iSchool at UBC. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, maybe this uh, maybe this makes sense for me. Um, and then when I was a student, I was fortunate to uh, work at Huiwa Library as a student librarian. And so got to learn from Carlene and Kayla and Sarah, Tamas and um, Eleanor. And uh, I'm realizing now as the only indigenous librarian at Okanagan College, how spoiled I was to be surrounded by uh, indigenous librarians. Um, so I'm super grateful uh, to them. And then also, of course, to my family who have uh, supported me in every educational um, track that I tried. You know, it's like, you want to do that? Great. You want to do that? Super. Awesome. Do it all. Um, so, yeah, I just thank them as well. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to get to know all of you um, across the, uh, the country here today. And thank you for sharing um, your entry into librarianship and a little bit about the people who um, uh, steered you in this direction and then mentored you through it. Uh, that's terrific. I wanted to ask each of you, and I'm just gonna call you out, probably go in a little bit different order every time. Um, uh, so this question is for all of you and I'll let you each have a few minutes to answer. I know this is a very large um, topic, but if you could just focus in on a few things, that would be great. Um, so what are some of the systemic changes that still need to be made in librarianship? And um, I'll start off with uh, Michaela this time. 
Sure. So there is lots to cover and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna step on anyone's toes. So I'm gonna stay in a specific lane. Um, so when I started my career in libraries, folks were slowly kind of decolonizing their subject headings. Um, so this is six or seven years ago, I guess. So as a recap, that's when we were like out with Indians of North America and in with Indigenous peoples of. Um, so that was that was that whole thing. Shout out to Camille, who I mean, I would bet that you were behind that. Um, but that that started this like itch in my brain uh, where I kept thinking, but but why are we in the ease? And I think I think about this all the time. And if if anyone wants to actually help me take this out of my brain and put it onto paper, I would love that uh, because this has been sitting in my brain for years now. Why are Indigenous peoples in history can contemporary contemporary topics? We are in Library of Congress. We are history. We're not history. We're sitting right here, like. You know, I'm seeing I'm seeing five indigenous faces sitting right here right now in librarianship. We're not history. Um, we're doing awesome, amazing contemporary things, um, things like uh, indigenous fashion designers. Even why, why is that not with with fashion of created by people of of other races, um, beading, art, writing math, science, it doesn't belong in the ease. And I could rant about this forever. So I'm going to. Well, thank you so much. I think we can all agree with that and uh, emphasize that as well. I, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, and uh, here we are, we remain. And so I always like to make sure that people know that we're right here and we survive. Um, Sheila, what are some of the systemic changes that you feel still need to be made? Yeah, um, same, same, Michaela. Like it's, yeah, like it's kind of daunting when you, uh, I've talked a lot about this in the past, like uh, about like the need for decolonizing um, subject headings. Um, it's uh easy it's like low-hanging fruit like it's like of course like that's the big problem like that's like an easy thing to start with you know the whole uh foundation that we've been built on <laughs> so we'll just start there I guess um why not but I think because like I have like talked about it before in the past and like done a lot of um work around this now it's the time to like do stuff um like really and like when I was working at the University of Alberta um on the decolonizing description project like uh as that was a fantastic um thing to for me to do and like a lot of um I learned so much about like more about the way like academia works um and uh just everything about like how this world is um but i think uh a thought that occurred to me when i was in a cynical phase <laughs> um was like okay i get why this is my job like to be like as a metis person to be working on a decolonizing thing i get that but why is it my job like i didn't make this mess <laughs> so like why do I have to clean this up? Like, so I think uh, there's a lot of people um, at a lot of other institutions that like maybe have more clout than I did and like, and now do as well. Um, Cause I find myself now in my role, like teaching around the catalog and like, Hey, this is how you do it. Like you have to like, hack the subject headings and then and then you'll find uh where you are in this so um yeah that's a that's a big thing um also like uh, just a as a segue for like systemic things like um we can also be like interested in and have expertise in like many things like 
many, many things. Like it's, it would be amazing if we could just flourish in uh, whatever we wanted, not just like, oh, you're indigenous, you gotta, here you are. This is what we would like, like from you. So thank you, uh, stay there. Um, so yeah, really like expanding uh, what else we have. And like the things that have really like, um, excited me and like really like uh pushed me as like oh yeah like I have like other things going on like and I have other um knowledge areas uh so and I can do those as well as be an expert in indigenous stuff well thank you so much uh, Sheila I think that's very good points that um, Indigenous people shouldn't be stuck in either services or um, cataloging as well too. Um, so I'm going to go over to um, Aikiula and if you can tell us uh, what do you think some of the systemic changes um, that still need to be made beyond uh, what we've already discussed. Um, yeah I think one of the things that was uh you know, one of the suggestions, things we might talk about was um, Indigenous cultural competency training, um, which is something I've been thinking about lately, because that's uh, something my department is looking at to sort of keep some momentum going, because um, there were, we had a learning session, um, the college hosted just prior to the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. So um, still like super developing <laughs> ideas about this. Um, because what we're doing right now as a as a department is looking at the UBC Indigenous Foundations website and having this discussion area on teams and uh, my initial thoughts were around you know everybody is at a different stage of learning and so maybe this would provide a bit of a baseline of knowledge um, but I think that like, the approach that we're taking is going to take us a long time to get through it. <laughs> and it's like, maybe we could speed this up uh, a bit. And it also, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily engage everybody in the same way. And also it doesn't account for when we bring somebody new into, you know, into our team. Um, and then it's like, where do you start again? like back from the beginning, like, you know, how do we, how do we sort of keep things moving forward? Um, so I think it's really good to have this dedicated space though for discussion and knowledge sharing. But I think um, in this instance, like what is our goal um, at this moment? Um, and just an example of a, a training session that I feel was a bit, you know, was kind of successful and, you know, <laughs> it's, I was at the uh, Emily Carr, um, the Aboriginal Gathering Place created this presentation called Indian 101, which provided this sort of brief uh, introductory history of colonization and sort of focused on West Coast experiences. And, um, and I think it helped to start a dialogue and allowed people to see what they didn't know you know, and maybe uh, hopefully I think um, encourage them to continue their learning on their own. Um, and it was originally for faculty, um, but then it was uh, brought into like for first year students and for master students. So, um, which I think is really, um, it's so good to get all areas of the university. It's not just for faculty or it's not just for students it's for you know it's it should be for everybody that's a part of this community um and I was thinking about how having something that's sort of uh on demand <laughs> is uh is a way to make it a part of training and make it institution-wide um so that and so that it's it's something that you're not starting over every time and being like, how do we approach it this time? Um, you know, we've got 10 new people, but we won't be doing anything for another year. You know, that, that kind of approach is sort of seems to be, be the way things are going um, at the moment. Um, and I was thinking there could be a way to customize that for libraries. Um, and bringing in a discussion about the role of libraries and colonization, because I know in my program, that's not something that was really discussed. Um, and it was actually one of Jessie's talks that I attended where she, she brought this up 
And, uh, you know, I think libraries are often described as colonial institutions, but like, could we be more intentional and explicit about what that means? Um, and I also think a lot of people go to these workshops and they go again and they go again and they go again. Um, but I would like to see opportunities for them to share what they've learned and like, what has it prompted them to do beyond attending this workshop? Um, so one of my colleagues, uh, Jewel Gillies, who works in the Aboriginal Student Center, I uh, was recently posing that question, you know, we've had the discussion, so what is your action? And I think that's something I'd like to see. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really uh, appreciate you bringing that up. I think that's super important for us to remember that we have talked about this for a long time and it's really time for action. Um, and that uh, we have to continue to encourage people to uh, go on their own journey to find that knowledge. Um, but I think that that's some of the, um, uh, the problem is uh, how do you do that in institutional setting? And so it's great to hear you thinking about ways of being able to make that happen. Um, Jesse, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the systematic changes that you've seen um, that still need to happen and still need to be made. Yeah, for sure. Um, Jean Joseph, who is sort of the grandmother of us all in terms of Indigenous librarians, recently gave a talk at Dalhousie last this year, I think. And in it, she was talking about two things that still remain from the time that she was working in libraries. She's retired now. And one of them was terminology, which my fellow panelists have mentioned again, right? Just that continual dehumanization of Indigenous people in the way that they're described in our libraries and the way that those things are tied to real violence, right? The way that uh, that continued dehumanization translates into police brutality, it translates into you know, people being shot for going on private land, those kinds of things. So this is real world implications. And the other thing she talked about was the way that there is still such a divide, right? And so if we think about you know, public libraries on reserve, tribal libraries, just how underfunded they are, how they are really working from grant to grant to serve the people that they serve. And uh, how, when we think about that, as people that work in, in universities and just the absolute wealth that we work in. Now, people are often underpaid in universities and librarians are often underpaid too. So that I, I don't want, I wanna hold both of those things in this discussion. But when we think about the way that we are so separate, right? We are so separate from a lot of those grassroots concerns and the, the real kind of core of what we want to think about as librarians, we're often kind of separate from that. And so I think one of the ongoing systemic things that I see is this inability of the institutions to see themselves as part of this bigger system, right? To see themselves as being able to share that wealth. Um, and instead of actually supporting indigenous sovereignty and supporting indigenous resurgence, language revitalization, all these like really important things, um, instead they're sort of getting themselves like a pet Indian. <laughs> They're hiring one of us in each of these institutions and saying like, we're good now. So I think sometimes it really requires creativity to think beyond, okay, we've got somebody in the place and they're gonna fix it all for us. And really being thoughtful and generative about, no, 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 I'm part of this system too. And what can we as, a, as an institution, as a library, as people that have relatively um, great access to information comparatively, what do we do to make sure that that is shared widely? So yeah, that's um, those are some of the big things that I still see. Well, thank you, um, Jesse. that was great. And uh, really glad I wasn't on screen to start laughing about the pet Indian, but um, I really appreciate you bringing that out because I think it's really important for us to, um, uh, to recognize that hiring one person isn't going to change everything. So I wanted to move on to um, the next question, which is, and of course, I just missed my, my um, notes or misplaced my notes right now, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what suggestions that you have. Oh, sorry. Of course I did that. 
right away as soon as I move my sheet. Um, I wanted to ask the question now is, how do or should Indigenous knowledges and practice factor into performance evaluation and into decisions about promotion and tenure? So this actually really relates to that. And I was like, I know that I have this question that's and it's very important for us to answer that. So part of the reason why this question, and I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to this, is because so often uh, we have um, one person in each institution, and then they're expected to do all of the work with Indigenous communities, about Indigenous knowledge, about Indigenous cataloging, uh, Indigenous services, Indigenous uh, language translation, or including this, including that. And so it ends up that everything um, becomes um, that person's uh, responsibility. And so one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is that problem about how do Indigenous knowledges and practices factor into that performance evaluation and decisions of promotion and tenure. Um, and so I think that we have a lot of examples of uh, burnout. We have a lot of examples of Indigenous um, people in this profession um, leaving the profession because of um, some of these issues. And we also have examples of people working themselves to illness in this profession. And so we really want to be able to make changes with this. And one of the things that um, uh, we can do is through this uh, uh, um, promotion and through performance evaluation. So I think I'm going to do a little bit of a reverse um, again, and I'm going to start off with Jessie because she did bring that up and we'll start off with you on this one. Sure. So I recently got tenure at Mount Royal University. And uh, as anyone who is from there, and I know that there's some people that are on the on the call knows, uh, doing my annual report is the, my least favorite time of year because it seems like it's like not the work, right? It's like talking about the work, but it's not the work. And uh, what I find really challenging as somebody that does research that doesn't always go well, you know, I started a research project with elders from my community and then we had a lot of deaths and there was a, a bunch of suicides and, um, and you just, it was not the right time to be talking to people about this, right? And so uh, it, it, to be able to think about, okay, well, what do I do? And, and people have asked me, you know, when are you going to revisit that, that project? And I don't know if I'll ever revisit it, right? It, it now is sort of heavy because many of those people that I was going to speak to are now gone. Um, and so I think it's the, the re, an, an understanding of the fact that that methodology will look differently, that timelines look different. That can be really tough if you are working to a tenure and promotion criteria that is very rigid and um, doesn't allow for that, that sort of understanding or even doesn't allow for people to take care of things, right? So I have colleagues who have had to take, take their cousin's kids for a little bit or take care of their parents or just other life stuff has happened. And so that really slows down sort of the, your ability to just like, you know, set aside <laughs> two hours every day to do research that some people who are non-Indigenous can do. And so if you're, if you're doing research, I think it's, it's really the ability to articulate to a tenure committee how your research is not going to look like maybe what they expect. And that I've had some guidance in that from other um, non-librarian Indigenous faculty to think through that, but that's a big one, right? Is that um, research looks different and also life interacts with research and research is not it's not the king, <laughs> you know, it's the other taking care of the people around you is in my mind, just as important for me being a good librarian as pumping out another paper every year. So that to me is a big part of it. Thank you. Um, and I think I'm gonna go to Kayla if you wanted to answer this question. I know you're very new, but um, you seem to have some great insight in some of these matters. And I think that's really important because you're coming from a, a new perspective. So you're not as jaded as some of us who've been through this process. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about it just because I am a new librarian and you know, I don't have any experience at all with this, you know, the idea of promotion and tenure. Um, and I was thinking about it in terms of a student and um, non-Indigenous faculty within programs and um, 
maybe the the way you know for uh, indigenizing curriculum and like how does that factor into their evaluations i think um uh so my experience as a student at ubc um I was part of the First Nations curriculum concentration, and I think it's a really great opportunity for students who want to focus their projects on Indigenous perspectives and getting experience working with Indigenous organizations or indigenization projects, um, and to also to be um, part of a really lovely small community that's you know inside the iSchool. Um, but you know, there's only one Indigenous faculty member at the iSchool um, in UBC, Dr. Trisha Logan, who is amazing. Um, and there's only one course within that curriculum, which is specifically Indigenous focused. And so for all the remaining courses, the amount of time that's dedicated to discussing um, Indigenous perspectives varies super widely. Um, so I would say the majority of my experiences with faculty were quite positive, but I also didn't necessarily feel like I could consult with them on Indigenous focused projects because um, I didn't know that they had that expertise um, or interest. Um, and that's, you know, certainly my own interpretation of the situation. And, you know, maybe they knew things that I, I didn't realize, but I think part of that judgment was about how much Indigenous content they were providing in their class. Um, and so I wonder how my experience would have been different if, you know, there was a requirement to show this um, effort towards Indigenizing curriculum. Um, you know, maybe there wouldn't be a research methodologies class that had no mention of Indigenous research methodologies or even like OCAP principles. You know, maybe I would have felt more comfortable discussing these project ideas with faculty throughout my degree. Um, although I will also acknowledge that I'm not really good at asking for help. <laughs> so, you know, it's my own thing. Um, and I think if institutions are promoting themselves as being like committed to reconciliation, then maybe, you know, this is just another possible mechanism of, of accountability. Well, thank you so much. And I'm gonna jump over to uh, Michaela and ask her about, um, about um, how do you think that indigenous knowledges and practices factor into performance evaluation? and decisions of promotion and tenure. So how should they actually? Um, thank you. Okay, um, so why, here's the thing, here's the thing, several, several buckets and I have to, I have to put check marks in, in, in each of those buckets. Every year, Jesse brought up the annual report. Everybody hates that. If you like it, I don't know what to say. Um, you're, che you're checking off pieces. It feels it feels artificial. Um, my biggest my biggest grievance with this though is so so why why is a peer reviewed article the gold standard for getting tenure? Um, why not a podcast where I can actually naturally talk to folks about things? Why not a video? Um, I've made tons of videos making uh, faceless dolls and telling stories. Um, I can write academically and I do because I have to, but I'm a listener and I'm a storyteller. Um, and I just prefer natural conversations, especially surrounding topics that involve who I am as a person and for indigenous librarians. And I'm sure indigenous folks in a lot of sectors, who we are and what we do, we can't really separate them. We don't have that luxury. Um, it's it's personal. And I think that for indigenous folks, well, certainly for myself, research is not objective, it's subjective. Um, so following kind of Jesse's thought about research and pumping the idea of pumping out a paper every year, that's not my, that's not my priority. And I just don't see how it can be, especially if that requires me to ask community members and relationships that I have for their time. We have been studied a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, very little of that study actually, though, has benefited us in any way. It's like, look at the Indians. And 
I just do not feel good about asking my relationships to give me their time for something that isn't actually going to help them in any way. I don't, I don't want to quantify or qualify information. I want to listen to stories and I want to tell stories and I want to do that in a way that isn't the gold standard for tenure. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that and uh, definitely great points. And I'll just go over to um, uh, Sheila if she has anything to add to um, this discussion. Yeah, um, I don't have a lot of opinions on tenure because I'm not doing that, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I'm on contract, so um, which is fine. Like, it's totally fine. Um, like the pre-pandemic Sheila BC, like before COVID, like would have had a completely different answer to this question than I, I do now. Cause like the precariousness of like uh, our field really stressed me out. And like, I kept moving across the country for like, anyway, and trying to set roots down and anyway, whatever. But now I feel like, I think like our relationship to work has changed so much and like time. So like, I think the best thing that we could do is just <laughs> period. I think the best thing we could do would be just to throw the concept of linear time out because and like move to a more seasonal pro approach because that's just the way that it is. And like, I have no use for linear time, but um, I guess we're, we're still doing it. Um, and uh, I will say though that like, <laughs> I, I will say, oh, you can see my eye rolls. Oh shoot. Anyway, um, I will say though that like um, as someone who left academia and like went to like the public world again um, and then left that, like every time that like I have felt like good about like myself and like the work that I've been doing and the community building that I've been doing in the library I have been like in trouble and like uh had like check marks on my like progressive discipline like going forward so that's no details no anything but that's that's like the reality and like every time that I've been like told you're doing amazing sweetie or like whatever um I haven't felt good about myself like I've I've been like I'm not doing anything useful I'm just what am I doing here like what am I doing in this job I don't know what well, I tried it and here we are um so I feel like those like two things are um yeah like I never really feel like my work yeah, when I feel like I'm good at my job and I'm, like, I'm doing good with my job, I haven't really been <laughs> thought of as, or interpreted as that. Um, and it's it's hard to produce evidence when it's like, well, like, I know that people feel good when they come here and they, and it's like, do you have any evidence for that? Like, no, I don't. <laughs> other than like the smiles that you don't see and like the things that people like don't see. So like um, a, an idea that I've had is like, we often in public libraries, especially like have like uh, patron incident, incident databases where you have to like fill in a report and whatever, when like, there's like a thing that goes on like and it's like who did you have to call blah 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 like what happened like you know that kind of thing but we don't ever I've never worked in a place that has had um a database for like positive things and like because uh when I did work at the public library um I have seen like some of like the best and like most like giving and beautiful examples of humanity and like I don't know what's going to happen in the future like the whole future seems precarious right now so um 
So I can't really speak if like if tenure will ever be a thing for me because like I I don't know like the like I think about it's like hard for me to even like plan for Christmas and it's literally in a month. So like like that I I've lost sight of where the future is because it just seems like it's just not really a thing we can plan for anymore. And like that's what tenure and promotion is is like planning for your future. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, I will, I know I will carry those like moments of humanity, like with me wherever I end up for however long I'm around. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that insight from one troublemaker to another. Um, I think uh, one of the things that is very difficult with that is that how do you put in your performance review that you've hugged three students that day who are going through a really hard time and might not have might have left school if not and and those are things that are really important so I took out some threads there about our relationships and how they aren't actually uh, quantifiable in our reviews and part of that is um, where we need to see that change moving forward um, with communities and so um, and also to the draw on our personal relationships and that time it takes. So when we're going to ask a, um, a community member for something, there's a huge process involved that other people don't have to do when they just go and ask, say, an English professor who's non-Indigenous for help with projects. So I think that those are some of the things that need to be embedded as well. Um, and I took that from uh, your conversation. So I think that it's really important to remember some of those intangible types of relationships that actually don't come through in, in those things. And I like that idea of having the positive interactions rather than just the negative. That's excellent. Okay, so one of the things, I think we're gonna have to skip one of the questions, but I'm gonna jump down to the last one. If we have enough time, we'll go back, but uh, because I think that some of these have been brought out with other things. So one of the, um, uh, and the emotional labor that we do as Indigenous librarians and library techs and staff is often unrecognized. And I think we've talked a little bit about that already. Um, so the last kind of question that I'm gonna ask before we take questions from the, um, from the uh, audience is, um, in many institutions, there seems to be a disconnect between how indigeneity is celebrated and the daily experiences of Indigenous library staff. What can institutions do to ensure that they're walking the talk? And I think we've already heard a little bit about that, but I wondered if we can talk about how um, academic and public libraries, and because this is specifically about academic, but how can we be warm and welcoming and inclusive? How can we ensure that Indigenous colleagues um, feel a true sense of belonging and that people are actually committed to reconciliation and how they're walking the talk about reconciliation? What are people actually doing? And I guess what I want to hear from each of you is um, your recommendations to institutions on how we can do this. So moving forward, we've talked about some of the uh, problematic scenarios and what's happening and that things aren't being recognized but now it's really about time to say what is your recommendation to institutions to be able to do this work and to walk the talk and with that I'm going to start off with um, Jesse first and then we'll move on. Sure. Um, you can do all of the cultural competency you want you can you know Recatalog your books, you can hire Indigenous people, but if your security guards are hustling Indigenous people out of your library, it's all failed, right? And so thinking about the culture of welcoming, I think that we can create, you know, at Mount Royal, we have Blackfoot signage um, in, in kind of destination signage for collections, and there's an app that you can use to listen to it. And so there's, there's, there's visual things that you can do. There are processes like eliminating fines that you can have that, that, that are thinking about that idea of being welcoming, but it really is thinking about how those structures that are really punitive to Indigenous people, how those really persist, right? And so um, what's the culture of surveillance at your library? And, you know, right now in our library, we have uh, security guards who are not our regular security guards. They're hired because 
um, our library is a point of um, verification. You have to show that you're vaccinated. And uh, I was harassed the other day <laughs> by one of them because I couldn't get my uh, QR code up fast enough. And you know, it's, it's so it happens at every level, right? It's not just students that are getting hustled out of there, but it's also, you know, it's like the the workers in our library, right? It's it's baseline care and welcoming, and we have control over those things, right? And we can we can adjust those things. They take a long time to fix, but it's really important for us to think through how there's like basic human relationships that need to be affirmed when people walk into our libraries. Thank you so much, um, uh, Jesse. I think that those are great uh, points for people to take away. Michaela, what did you have to um, uh, suggest and advise um, in academic libraries and other institutions to do? Um, please compensate us for our emotional labor. Uh, you, you institutions, you need to provide formalized debriefing, counseling, sharing circles, something. You need to provide something. Um, I cannot tell you how many times that the requirements of my past jobs have harmed me emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically even. Um, the idea that no one in an administrator role has even thought twice about sending me and Indigenous colleagues in to teach about uh, residential schools or to teach about the Indian Act um, to, quite frankly, what has been a hostile audience. Um, and, and, and I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why. I, I didn't sign up for this job to be attacked for who I am and what the truth is, despite people not wanting to hear it. And then to be to be asked to do that without any follow-up, no basic care for our wellness, knowing and then knowing that I have if, if I wanted any support whatsoever, where am I getting that support? I'm relying on my Indigenous friends and colleagues who are already, already shouldering their own. And now we're doing emotional labor for each other. We take that home. Um, and, and that's on the institutions. There needs to be something formal there. This isn't, like I said before, this isn't just what we do. We can't separate that from who we are when we are being asked to speak the truth that folks might not want to hear and do better. Thank you so much for that. I think those are really crucial points um, and that emotional support and compensation is huge with um, Indigenous um, um, people and professionals in this field. Hi, Paola, did you want to address this next? Um, sure. Um, I, sort of thinking along the same lines as, as Jesse in terms of like, you know, the security guards uh, are a part of that community as well. But I think also um, sometimes people in, in the higher positions have these, you know, there there's the statement of the commitment to reconciliation, but then there's the action. Um, for instance, we have an Indigenous garden um, at the Kelowna campus, and um, somebody decided that it was messy and it needed to be cleaned up, and that uh, and they had landscapers come and cut down the plants, which had been uh, were being reserved for programming with Indigenous students, and so you know there wasn't a consultation with um, anybody Indigenous who is, you know, in charge, it's, you know, in charge of that garden. Um, so it's sort of these unilateral um, decisions being made. Uh, it's the indigenous garden, <laughs> like maybe go talk to somebody who's indigenous and, and figure out uh, what's happening. Um, um, and I was also thinking about like, as being somebody who's new um, and coming into a, a new workplace, um, 
what are you, as an institution, what are you doing to make sure that that space is safe? Um, if I'm the first Indigenous person that's ever worked in your library, you know, what are you doing to make sure that it's good before I get there? You know, like, why are you waiting for cultural competency training when I get, when I'm already here, you know, that kind of thing. So it's sort of thinking ahead. Um, and I think also, you know, who are the other Indigenous people in your institution that maybe you can connect, uh, you know, a new person with? Um, I was connected with Jewel and I'm so uh, happy to have met them and, and they've been super warm and welcoming. Um, and I know that I can go and have candid conversations with them and, uh, you know, consult and find ways to collaborate uh, with, um, you know, in, in programming for Indigenous students. Um, and I also think about the importance of relationships, you know, what is the culture of your office? Um, I think, you know, the, the, the random hallway conversations that we have and the time that we take for like socialization is part of building relationships. Um, but if everybody's just sort of in their office all day working through their lunch, it's really hard to, to build those relationships. Um, in my previous position at Emily Carr, we had an open invitation to have lunch together every day. And I worked in a small department, but like that was a real community building um, opportunity. And I still have really great relationships with, with these colleagues of mine. I think that's a great point that you've, um, that you've touched upon is where is the support? And often it does come from our Indigenous uh, colleagues in the institution, even though we don't, because we often don't have them in the library, but expecting them to feel that without actually formalizing that is really important. Um, and formalizing situations in the library where there's cultural safety. So um, ensuring that, that just because a person is Indigenous doesn't mean that they're gonna be included by an Indigenous community that isn't their own. Um, and so expecting that, oh, well, they're busy with the Indigenous community and not including them in, in what the other staff is doing is really important as well, too. Uh, and so, Sheila, did you want to um, address what you think that um, institutions can do to walk the walk? Walk the yeah. talk, sorry. They need to walk the walk, too, though, but uh, they need to walk the talk, too. Yeah, and uh, they need to spend their money better. So uh, if we're not gonna, <laughs> if we're not gonna give the land back uh, that universities are built on, maybe we could build indigenous student housing on him. Number one. Uh, number two, maybe uh, we could make sure that our um, pensions and like other academic monies that we have, aren't being invested in projects where the Canadian state uh, reconciles with assault rifles and tanks. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And I think that goes along with we need, obviously housing is, is crucial. And so when we don't have housing for Indigenous students or Indigenous faculty, um, that makes a huge difference for um, integration into the academy. So we have about um, uh, 10 minutes left for some questions. And the first question that we do have that's um, uh, coming with, uh, uh, that has come from the uh, floor is, uh, what strategies do you use to push the assimilation into mainstream um, academic, uh, academic ways of being, knowing and teaching? Or how do you resist tokenism? Um, so what strategies do you use to push, I think it's push to assimilation, um, mainstream academies, ways of being and knowing. How do you resist tokenism? So um, maybe I'll start off with, um, uh, with you, Sheila, about that. Do you want to just say how you resist tokenism? We'll just open it up a little bit here too. Uh, people can uh, chime in for the answer if you want to unmute, since we have three questions, three big questions to answer. Yeah. Uh, how do I resist tokenism? Oh, man, I don't know. Um, okay, so I'm Métis at the University of Saskatchewan. Maybe you've heard about us. 
<laughs> about like about like uh we're having a little bit of a moment here on our campus um anyway i like a solution that has been proposed in the past has been um cluster hires of indigenous faculty and like um like so you hire one group cohort and then the next year you hire another cohort and another cohort and then eventually you have all these indigenous people and maybe they can make a community but like i've said this kind of jokingly and like maybe i'm not joking i don't know anymore like i'm like well maybe we just need to focus on cousin hires because like i work here and like my cousin is also faculty here like so so it's been like while we've been having our moment like it's been easy to be like for me just be like okay well yeah and colin is here like dr colin larock to everyone else who's not his cousin and uh and like okay like that's a way to um resist tokenism and he doesn't like he his whole thing is like geology uh and um like tree rings and like doing that so yes you can do anything indigenously uh it's 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 amazing what we can do when we're given the chance so thanks jesse did you want to weigh in on the tokenism how do we resist it and yeah uh, i think it's so for sure if it's if you're in a position to support an indigenous librarian or indigenous staff member in your library you should push them to do something that isn't indigenous so I was a building a co-building lead when we built our new library and it had nothing to do with the fact that I was indigenous, but it was something it was an, and it was a part of librarianship I didn't know anything about because obviously how often do you get to build a new building, but um, I think that was really that was a really useful experience and Deborah Peltier when I did my practicum at library and archives years ago. She told me they're always going to try and make you do indigenous stuff you're going to have to always push to do the other fun things the other things you want to do. So if you're in a position to support someone doing that offer them options right, they may have never thought about publishing in a particular area or taking on a particular project and so offer it to them see what they think about it. Great, thank you Michaela did you have any response. Sure. Um, I have never successfully been able to resist tokenism just just uh personally it's just kind of always happened to me but i am in a position now i have the loveliest team at work and when i first started my job i was chatting with my new boss and he was asking me some questions and then he said i don't mean to interrupt i'm so sorry you don't you don't owe it to me to tell me this i'm on a learning journey, so if you want to stop, we can stop. And i'm like whoa. Some white people say that other white people are like can I see your status card can I can I actually they don't ask to touch your hair they just touch it. Mm -hmm. But. I don't know do just meeting people who are willing to do the work on their own. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, Kila, do you have any um, things that you wanted to add to avoiding um, tokenism and pushing to assimilate? Um, I don't know if I can add anything. I'm so new. I feel like I'm, I'm you know, part of this is also me learning from um, these amazing uh, librarians, and I, I really appreciate um, Jesse's statement about you know pushing to to do things that are you know maybe not indigenous. Uh, focused and and uh, expanding um, opportunities for for people. Well, thank you so much. I agree with them. I, I, I think that it really has to happen that we push to be able to um, allow people to be what they want to be. So if they want to be a systems librarian, they should be able to do that. Or if they want to work in another area that doesn't have anything to do with Indigenous services, then that's something that should be able to happen. And I think um, there's been a real push to be able to have an Indigenous librarian at each uh, and many institutions. And so because of that, then it's like, OK, so you're the one and now you'll do everything. Um, and one of the things that I've always said is that uh, the work with Indigenous peoples 
uh, in libraries, it mirrors librarianship, Indigenous librarianship mirrors librarianship completely. And so how can you be all of those things to all of those people? And some of it is having um, allies that will support you in that. And I think this next question really has to do with that as well. Um, the second question is how do we encourage non-Indigenous librarians to take on Indigenous library, library work without appearing um, uh, to be appropriate to be appropriating such as art, language, um, knowledge, and other community-based um, uh, work that's doing decolonizing work. And I just wondered what uh, people's takes were on that. I think we've all um, uh, benefited from the experiences of having some amazing allies, and then we've all benefited from having experiences with um, maybe not so amazing allies and. Um, I wondered if um, there's a way uh, that each of you have been able to find successfully either in librarianship or in other uh, areas that you've um, that you've been involved in. So please feel free to answer that question. We'll just hear from whoever wants to approach it first can unmute. I think look to non-Indigenous people that are doing this work, right? There's been people that have been doing this for a really long time. You know, I think about Anne Carwigan building out the Indigenous intern program. And when people asked her how she did it, she just said like, well, you just put money towards it, right? Like, it's just a question of funding it, right? And so there's people that have been able to do that work. And so turn to kind of what they've been doing too, I think. You have good, you have good role models too. Um, I also think that you might, you know, if your if your indigenous librarian colleague keeps maybe bringing up an idea but is unable to get it off the ground, maybe offer to to help them out with that. There's a lot of big projects that people will kind of thrust upon us, but nobody else wants to do it because they feel like they can't. But you can, and we can work together and and you can even take the lead and we can we can just help in the background and that's that is i totally welcome and open to that collab i think um sort of echoing that as well um i have a good friend who's who's doing the the work who's not indigenous and and works in a um High school setting, um, but he he wants to do the reading and he wants to be really well informed and he wants to be able to have the arguments um, with people and so he will sometimes you know be like can I talk to you about this thing that I'm thinking about and I think um, that is a way um, like Michaela was saying like you, you can consult or you can collaborate on a project. I don't have anything else to say other than like I support my colleagues on this call. So yeah. That's well, and I think that we've actually added um, into uh, many different reports that people have done um, and including the truth and the answering to the TRC calls, uh, commissions calls to action when the CFLA FCAB did the truth and reconciliation report, there was parts in there about how to be a good ally. I, one of the things that for me irritates me is um, asking me the same question uh, over and over again. So please read that before you do your homework, before you come and exhaust another Indigenous librarian, because librarian, we've already answered that. Many of us were on there, we answered it for you. The other thing is gaslighting. So one of the things that happens often is that, um, uh, you need to support your Indigenous colleagues. So when you're at meetings and they make a suggestion, support it. Don't reword it and make it like it's yours. Um, just support that. So there's a lot of things like that that can be done. I was really disgusted, and I'll say this um, on, on, on air, that uh, when Dr. Jean Joseph gave her address for the Horhawks lecture, that someone asked her for a book list. There's Google, and there's First Nations Read that's... Uh, doing a great job from OLA. Uh, those are things that you can do yourself. You don't really need us to do them. So supporting Indigenous people to do the work. So there's a lot of work that we do as Indigenous people that non-Indigenous people can't do, but there's a lot of work that you can do um, that you're able to do without um, us having to do that busy work. And so I think that's part of supporting as well. 
um, and to ask a, a retired uh, elder uh, to get you a book list is really inappropriate. So um, just think about that when you go to ask questions about two Indigenous people. Have I done my reading? Have I done my research? Um, because we're librarians, so we should actually be doing that first. And when you approach people, approach with respect. Don't just expect them to give you all their knowledge like that. Oh, I know everything about that. Because there's some areas that we don't know about and where we don't want to um, or we are not able to speak about because of our own relationships or our protocols. So I think that that's really important too. So just being respectful. And uh, I have some great allies that I've been with in this journey for many years. Um, and uh, Anne Kerwigan is definitely one of them, Alyssa Cherry. I mean, I can go on and on and list people from across every province, but I look at them and I think, okay, what did they do? They just, they supported. And so, it is about being supportive to our colleagues. So I just wanna encourage that as well. The third question, and I think this will have to be our last question, is that um, the thoughts about indigenous librarianship, which focuses on deep and long relationship building, bumps into the librarian job market, which often requires folks to move for short-term contracts before leaving again. How can we build relationships that are integral to our jobs with relative little job security? So excellent question. Um, and I think people need to put their money where their, their words into action and their money into that action to be able to create jobs that aren't two year terms or contracts, but actual meaningful employment for indigenous people. So I'll answer that one, but I think we have a few people that have already touched on that one. So I will go to, um, Michaela, first, if you wanted to just add a quick thought on that, because we're just running out of time right now. Sure, absolutely. Um, I am in touch with community members and folks that I met through every job that I've ever had. Um, and so I think that sometimes building community isn't isn't the physical fixed community sometimes. It is that virtual community like Sheila and Jesse were talking about Twitter. Indigenous librarians, come come on Twitter. We're awesome. Excellent. Uh, uh, Sheila, did you want to speak about job insecurity? I think you might have already touched on it if you don't feel like talking about it again. No, I'm on contract. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll go to, to Kiola. <laughs> did you um, want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, I'm I'm really fortunate in that um, my job is is not a contract position, um, and so there is the opportunity here to grow relationships um, over time. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but I also think Michaela is right in that there are, you know, uh, ways to have community um, with people that are far away from you. Um, thankfully, to uh, social media, <laughs> the one good aspect of it. That's great. And Jesse, did you want to talk a little bit about um, deep and long relationships? Because you've been able to uh, come right out of library school and, and achieve a tenure position. Yeah, it didn't start as a tenure position. I did four years of contracts at Mount Royal before uh, they had this as a job option. So I know that life <laughs> <laughs> of applying for your same job every year. Um, I think it comes down to the structure, right? And I would much rather have colleagues who are from different backgrounds bringing that lived experience into the library than another associate vice president. And so it's it's uh, <laughs> working with your union to push for that and to, to really take your institution to task to say, why do we have another person at this level of administration when the people doing the work, we really need help, right? We really need to build in long-term positions that have benefits. And so all of us, I'm sure, have seen multiple administrators um, be added in our time at universities. And yet we're often still, uh, oftentimes the only non-white librarian on our team. So it's it has to happen structurally because you can do great work by yourself, but you really need sort of a community to to thrive. So I'll leave it at that. 
Exactly. And I think that that's such a crucial point and succession planning really needs to be built into Indigenous librarianship um, so that everything doesn't solely rest on one person. Um, you know, I, I I remember being in those same situations where it was contract to contract and um, I moved from my own province to be able to um, gain a permanent position. And I think that that's really important for people to understand that that's some of the sacrifices that people are making, that they're moving away from all of their supports to be able to come and work for uh, you, but you don't have anyone else there with them. And so I think that that's really important to remember. I was very fortunate to work with Lyle Ford, a Métis librarian uh, when I was at UM, but, and he wasn't in a Indigenous position. So that was really interesting. Um, but I also think that it, um, it's really hard for people to come out and say who they are and what they are. I know librarians who haven't, um, who were um, passing and they didn't come out because they didn't want to be stuck with all the Indigenous work. So having support there, people who want to be there, hiring more than one Indigenous person, having support for them when they do come is really important. And that job security is huge. The job security issue of not knowing whether or not you have a job um, or whether you're secure in your position or if you're covered by the union. So people talk a lot about intellectual freedom. They ask Indigenous librarians for opinions on things, but when they get the opinion, they may not like them. And that always puts us into a precarious position within our employment. So I think that those are things that we really need to revisit and ensure that if people come into this profession, that we welcome them into it that we're not that token. I mean, I think we've heard a lot of these themes that we recognize the emotional labor that goes into the work that we're doing, uh, that we need more uh, allies um, that are true allies, uh, like some of the people that we've mentioned today. And there's so many more. I mean, I can't even name all of them that have come forward to be able to help, especially since the uh, uh, TRC released their report and calls to action. So. Um, I do want to thank you all for being here. I'm sure we're probably preaching to the choir, so to speak, here because of um, who joined the call. But I do hope that there is some systemic changes happening in institutions um, so that we can support um, the work that's going on now with our Indigenous communities and with Indigenous people and ways of knowing. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for your time and for joining us here today and thank all of these four younger Indigenous librarians who I'm really looking forward to seeing where you go and how you grow. And I know you're going to change the profession and do amazing work. So uh, thank you very much, Madhu Cho, which means um, huge thank you in Teltan. And I'll turn it back over to Julie now. Thanks, Camille. I know we're over time, so I'll be very quick. Um, just on behalf of Carl, I'd like to thank our presenters for leading this great discussion, uh, Camille for moderating, and all of our participants for attending. Uh, we ask that you please keep an eye out for upcoming webinars in this series, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks again, and have a great week, everyone.